Hello and welcome to Podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. I would like to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. Your contributions help to make the show sustainable. When you're ready to launch your next project, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode at www.podcastinit.com slash Linode and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for running your app or experimenting with something that you hear about on the show. You can visit the site at www.podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, read the show notes, and get in touch. To help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music, tell your friends and coworkers, and share it on social media. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Jonas Neubert about using Python for industrial automation as a follow-on from his talk at PyCon, where he gave a wonderful presentation about using some Python libraries for being able to uh, control his mini factory that he brought on stage. So if you haven't seen the talk, I definitely recommend giving it a listen and a watch, and uh, we've got some good questions to follow on from that. So with that, I will ask you to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi. Um, so my name is Jonas, and I, I consider myself a like a multidisciplinary engineer in a way. I was um, I was trained in undergraduate and grad school as a mechanical engineer. Always been coding a little bit here and there. Uh, also picked up some electrical engineering along the way when I was working on robotics. And more recently, after moving to the San Francisco Bay Area, like everyone who does that, I steadily became a software engineer. So what I'm really spending my days with these days is somewhere at the intersection of software and factories. So industrial automation, obviously, is uh, I think the title of, our, of the podcast here. So, so that's what I do. And right now uh, I'm working for a company called Tempo Automation, where we have a, a circuit board factory and, and try to apply really clever automation and software tricks to, to get you prototype and small run circuit board super fast within three days if everything goes, goes well and you have a not too complicated job for us. And do you remember how you first got introduced to Python? I, I sure do remember. I, I, it was a quite traumatic experience, actually. Um, I used to, like I said, I always used to be coding a little bit and, you know, since since high school, I think. Um, and I always used PHP. And at, at some point, you know, I, I really didn't know that much about software engineering or anything, but I, I ended up making this app for, this was when, when Palm still made smartphones, like the Palm Pre. And we made a World Cup, like life score app and that got pretty popular and this is the first time i ran into the situation that you know my my shared web host definitely didn't take the load anymore so i made the snap decision to switch to google app engine and back then they had java and python to choose from as languages so that's that was my very rushed introduction to python the first time around um i think um after after that, I let it rest for a little bit, and then I started using Python in earnest just uh, four four or five years ago when I started a job that just uh, happened to have Python as the primary language. And but since then, I've been using it I think every day. And how did you first get involved in factory automation? I've always had a had this interest in how things get made in complicated machinery. So I remember when I when I was in high school, I always. I went to school in Germany, so there isn't really a notion of middle school, high school like this. But during these years, I always went to schools that were really into humanities and languages. So engineering was never really part of my curriculum that much, you know, besides the usual maths and physics classes and things like that. But I, I had put it in my in my head to to use that that industry internship that we had to do in, I think grade 11, uh, to do that in some something that has to do with a factory. And, and there was a, a speaker who came to our school just to give some, some talk, and he worked at a semiconductor factory that wasn't too far away. And I just went up to him and said, like, hey, I'm, I'm interested in factories. I don't really know anything about it, and I don't really know what I would be doing there, but... Sounds like you're an engineer at a semiconductor factory. How about, you know, giving me an internship? And and that's what he did. So I ended up <laughs> spending like three weeks um, at this company called Infineon. They, they're, or they're long gone. They, they used to be, they used to make DRAM, like they were the big, one of the biggest DRAM producers in the world. And they made these 300 millimeter silicone wafers. So it's like 12 inches, like just discs that basically came out of their factories and, you know, ultimately get sold in, in little black plastic enclosures that sit on a circuit board that used to be slotted into your main board on your computer. That's how it worked back then, right? Now it's all a little smaller. And I, yeah, I spent three weeks there um, and they were adding this transport system in the factory so that instead of operators carrying around these really heavy 
pods full of uh, silicon wafers they would be running on like a rail system under the ceiling and and trying to get all the it in and so complete complete random chance event that i got to see this but i basically um from then on i did i did a whole bunch of other things did a little bit of building small robots in school um and uh you know a couple of coding small jobs here and there but i always came back to factories for other internships and then now you know doing it professionally uh for you know for for over five years now doing anything from steel factories where there's a 20 ton coils of steel flying over your head on cranes to my my previous job that i worked in for a couple of years was at a at a biotech company that had a, a lab where you know the factory is basically working with with blood and dna very small but same principles and it's just really fun because these it, it's almost it's like software but you can watch it do things things are moving so that that's what really got me hooked you know over a decade ago at that internship and that's what still excites me like really every day yeah it's definitely interesting being able to see the things that you're working on manifest in a realm and a dimension that you can actually tangibly experience as opposed to the very abstract notions that we all have to carry around in our head when we're actually building some of these more digital systems or web systems where the only incarnation of the work that you're doing is when it actually gets displayed on a screen whereas all of the actual sort of logical bits are hidden from view and so being able to actually see those implemented in mechanical actions must be quite interesting yes it, it definitely is and you know there's nothing wrong with writing software like software changes lives like sure changes my life it just seems to me like especially in software engineering everyone is so focused on on a few domains of application you know everyone's making like these days a lot of people are making apps or data science is, is a big thing and and nothing wrong with doing that but considering like the sheer size of the domain of making physical goods like you know you look around you all these things are made in a factory somewhere very few people actually have a have an interest or a, a knowledge in in working on these things which is surprising but it's also obviously it's great for me right uh, because i there, there's plenty of work uh, waiting to be done in that field um, and if you know if it's not so overcrowded works for me <laughs> Given that so many people who do work in software are dealing with these more ephemeral implementations of that software, what are some of the technical challenges that are unique to a factory and physical computing environment where you're actually interfacing directly with the hardware and the actions that it needs to take in three-dimensional space? Yeah, so there aren't that many unique challenges that, you know, once you've taken care of this kind of like instrument driver layer where you do whatever it takes to speak to the instrument. You, a factory turns into this into a system that's actually quite similar to many software-only systems. You know, uh, like if you think about service-oriented architectures that many people are using, where you know different servers offer like interface to do a, some sort of compute task. I mean, a factory is really nothing else except that it's not a compute task, but a, a task to move a crate along a conveyor belt or to I don't know run a run a robot to do a to weld uh, to pieces of metal together uh, so in a way it's very similar on the other hand there are of course a couple of things that are specific to working with the real world that just don't matter in a purely software realm one being that developers these days are very used to just you know spinning up a second and a third and a hundredth <laughs> a copy of a of a server to you know to spread the load or something like that obviously that doesn't work if you have one robot it's a singleton device that isn't easily replicated unless you have to spare change to buy a second robot some other things are um, that, that i've that i've struggled with or that i've seen others struggle with who come from a pure software background is that that time is you know is running at the pace it's running at so physical physical actions take time to complete so you're actually you can't just specify that your services respond within 10 seconds write it in the spec and just deploy enough compute power to make it happen some things take a minute some things take an hour to actually just perform because because physics <laughs> so so this is you know these are the types of things you run into but none of them you know once you wrap your, he your head around the application and, and understand what you're trying to do none of those are rocket science really it's just it adds a couple of interesting constraints to how you can write your code and some things that matter elsewhere like super fast compute performance might not matter for you because you're working with a slow robot and there's no need to be fast and I imagine that given the fact that you are dealing with these physical systems, that some of the concepts that you might be less likely to just sort of be cavalier about how you're 
implementing your code or deploying it because of the fact that if you do have some critical failure in the control system that you're sending to this particular piece of hardware, it might actually result in a failure of the physical device, which could end up costing, you know, several hundreds or thousands of dollars to replace. Whereas if you have a bug in your web server and you deploy it and it fails, well, then you just, you know, destroy that instance and rebuild a new one. So uh, what are some of the testing methodologies that you have to be a little bit more careful about and uh, some of the ways that you do ensure proper reliability and safety in the code that you're deploying to these instruments? This is a topic you could spend, you know, months talking about. And, you know, there are people who actually talk talk about it for months. Um, but let's try to, let, let me see, what are the, like, the the quick sound bites to, to break out of that. One thing I, I covered in my talk is that you, you have to be careful which type of technology you, like what you apply it to. Generally, as a rule of thumb, if something is critical to the safety of a machine or even the safety of humans, you uh, using Python for it seems seems not right because Python, you know, doesn't have real-time guarantees and Python, you know, Python code runs usually on operating systems with other tasks running in parallel. You know, it might stall, it might crash. So safety critical things. Uh, if you find yourself in a situation where you use Python to implement a safety critical feature, take a step back, think about it, maybe use something that's more appropriate for that. Uh, in, in my talk at PyCon, uh, if you watch the video, you'll see that I have one of those programmable logic controllers, PLCs, which are very frequently found. Pretty much every factory will have one or many of those. And, and those, you know, you program them in this ancient language and it kind of seems funny if you think about it through software developer eyes, but they are designed to be, you know, fault tolerant. You, if you have a safety system like a light curtain hooked up to them, you'd probably be using extra expensive gear where all the wiring is duplicate or triplicate to be fault tolerant and things like that. So uh, safety of humans and machines is, some, is a very serious topic and that you really want to make sure you design you design that correctly. So that, that's one aspect of that. The other one is testing, big scope of how do you test things when, when the you know, like a side effect of the execution of your code is, is a robot like flinging around a half ton car, say, or something like that. And there are a lot of standards and best practices that people in industrial automation would use. So there's like this entire field and many books written on acceptance testing. So very much analogous to how software developers would be used to having unit tests and integration tests and maybe a continuous integration type system that's running their tests for them before doing a release. Uh, there, there are analogous methods in in building industrial syst like industrial automation systems and factories, where you usually start with a functional requirements document, where you just enumerate in, in painstaking detail what's supposed to happen. Like if 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 operator presses the green button, um, the conveyor belt starts moving at I don't know 10 meters a second, something like that, and reaches that speed after a speed up phase, you know, within, I don't know, within 10 seconds, something like that. Um, if, you know, if, uh, if this sensor detects um, that a light broken, uh, a light curtain is broken, the robot arm stops within, you know, 10 milliseconds. And if it, if it happens to be holding a sharp object, you know, we, we test that the sharp object doesn't penetrate deeper than 10 millimeters into a into a test object that's as soft as a human would be. Things like that are actually like in these requirements documents. And then um, the way it usually works is that the uh, the person or the, the group of people building a system like this are different from the ones operating it. So if you operate a factory, you usually don't have software developers and you know integration engineers on hand. You you ask a system integrator to go out and get all the components, put them together, do the programming, put all the wires together, and then they ship that system to your factory. So there there's a pretty I think it's a pretty common commonly used protocol of having a factory acceptance test first, where while it's still in the place where you know at the system integrator they test all the functional aspects that make sense to test when you have the people around. Who built the system and you know that that's basically like can the robot arm actually reach all the places where it needs to pick things up and drop them off um and and um you know do like do all the switches work do do all the things that are meant to move move and all the things that are meant to be fixed are they fixed once they're happy with that and you know iron out all the, the little bugs uh in the system they ship it to the factory that's trying to actually use the system to for their for whatever their process is and, and then you do a site acceptance test which which is all the things that make sense to do when you have the 
the end users around. So this is more like the integration test in, in a software sense, you know, where people go around, press buttons and, and, and actually try to, to build whatever widget it is they're trying to build with that machine you gave them. And, and you know, that's just a very high level. Uh, I'm actually not really an expert on this. Actually, there's, like, there's, another, there's a whole other dimension if you are in a regulated environment. So if you're doing laboratory automation and you do like diagnostic tests, then you have to deal with regu regulatory agencies who come in and do an audit, which is a whole other area. And there are entire job titles dedicated to just dealing with all this. So, so I'm by far from expert in this, but that's roughly what you do. And it, it all maps kind of one-to-one -to, -one to software development concepts like unit testing for the small functional tests, integration tests for actually executing protocols that people would do uh, and so on. Yeah, from a high level, it definitely seems like you'd be taking sort of similar approaches of the idea of the testing pyramid, where you have all of your fast, easy tests that aren't dependent on actually interfacing with the hardware to just exercise the software itself. And then when you have to actually ship it and make sure that everything's working together, like you said, you have the integration testing is in the form of the factory, accept factory acceptance. Yeah, that's that's right. And in a way, um, even with the little mini factory that I brought to to PyCon, which was just a conveyor belt, a barcode scanner, and a, and a PLC to control it all, I actually had all of those. Right. Um, so when I first arrived in Portland, I opened up the suitcase that you know the the demo was traveling in, and I had a little almost like a unit test script that just like actuated every actuator once, like each of the two little paddles that were there for sorting things got just like flipped once the conveyor went like on went through like two type like two speed settings and a, and the barcode was trying to be scanned and that was like you know my unit test suite and then i carried it to the conference center and you know ran the unit tests again but then i actually did the functional test of actually running the demo that i was going to run on, on stage and you know that's you know toy little toy example but that's in the end that's what you have to do to confirm that it's actually working and I imagine, too, that given the fact that you do have the physical interface and the, the mechanisms that are operating within the you know, robot or the piece of hardware, that, that would also introduce an entirely new dimension to debugging issues because of the fact that, well, the software itself may be executing perfectly. There might be some uh, mechanical failure that's happening that causes the actual action not to be formed exactly as it's intended to be. So while you may initially suspect that there's a glitch in the software that you deployed, it turns out that there's actually you know something with the physical interface that you have to find and address. So as with testing in general, you get into a combinatorial matrix that it's just sort of impossible to really find your way out of and you just have to do best effort. That, that's true. I mean, the, the concept of mocking takes a whole new dimension when the mock you're writing is for a physical machine and not a, like, let's say, a web server. And yes, that simulations of machines, like mocking out, you know, simple things like barcode scanners uh, is definitely uh, something you, you do as you, you know, if you're on the software end of writing an, an industrial automation system, you will you will use these mocks. However, if you are like on the, on the controls end and you're in charge of, you know, wiring up all the sensors, uh, then your debugging toolkit will probably probably include uh, multimeters and protocol analyzers. And the coolest ones, in my mind, uh, are the bugs that are completely unclear where in the stack they are, where you, know, you, you have a barcode reader and every hundredth scan, one of the characters is missing. And you know, it could be anything. You could have a bug in your code. You could have the barcode reader misconfigured, or maybe it's just broken. And months later, you find out the reason is that you ran the cable too close to a to a motor, which introduced noise into the transmission. And because the vendor used a protocol that doesn't have checksums, the serial transmission got scrambled. You know, that's an actual story. And I think those are the coolest bugs to debug. But obviously, if, if all you're trying to do is earn money with a factory, those are probably the worst ones. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, it sounded like... Like there is some actual uh, experienced pain behind that story there. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I shouldn't take too much credit for that. I think most of the pain was experienced by my colleagues uh, <laughs> on that one who were doing like the control side of things. But yeah, I mean, true story. That That's something that definitely happened. And so when most people think factories, they're not necessarily going to jump immediately to Python as the language that controls them. So I'm wondering, what are some of the languages that are most frequently used for command and control of these industrial systems? And how does Python play a part? Yeah, so um, 
Really, the, the short and honest answer is that Python plays no part unless you make it play a part. Python is really a, a, a tiny little niche in this area. There are many languages involved, um, and it really depends entirely even what industry you're in. Many, many pieces of equipment just come with vendor-specific languages. Oftentimes this is like, you know, just text files, like lists, lists of instructions. If, if you've ever worked with 3D printers, uh, you might be familiar with G-code, which is just like this long list of instructions for where to move the printhead and, and how fast to deposit material. That's, that's actually a language that's been around forever for computer controlled machining, like CNC machining. Um, anything where you have a gantry that moves in XYZ and then machines would use that language. There are other pieces of equipment, and I find that a bit of a disturbing trend where there's just the assumption that you don't program them in a, in a software development sense. You, you use like GUI tools. Um, and they give you, you know, usually some Windows software and you click something together. Sometimes it's like lab view, graphical programming style. Sometimes it's, you know, much more primitive things. Um, then, then when you get to actual real programming languages, like the way you and I would think about it. There are some there are some traditional ones. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind that is that factories have a much longer lifetime than your typical web, you know, web uh, application. You know, they, they might just sit there for 20 years without, you know, any significant updates. So a lot of these languages, say, that, that get used there are pretty old. So one of them, like the one that there's a standard, it's called, um, let, me look, uh, let me look this up here in my notes, IEC uh, 611.31, which is a family of, I think, five languages that you use to program these real-time control systems. Um, the uh, programmable logic controller that I mentioned earlier, it looks a little bit like Pascal, uh, it, that's the one I use, that structured text. There's a thing called ladder logic, and I really encourage everyone to look this up. This is like a, a graphical language where you have like two lines right and left that represent basically wires that have a voltage on it, and you connect them with like switches and, and elements like that, and you program that way. It's kind of a cool concept, but really hard to explain. Um, you know, you don't see how I'm waving my hands in the air here. So there are some of those languages. And then as we get like, as we get to more modern things, it's, it's mostly a Microsoft stack that you would find. If, if you do find like a, a modern software stack in a factory, maybe because, you know, um, it's a more recent factory that, that was built within the past decades or, or because you're in an industry that just is more advanced, like Semiconductor being one, uh, most of the software is, is like a Microsoft stack. And that's actually, that makes it all the way through to the industry standards. Like there's, um, there's an, a standards body called OPC, which is pretty widespread uh, in industrial automation, which is a standard for how these, you know, real-time systems share data and make it so that the data that they get from sensors can show up on the screen somewhere to be monitored, for example. And the original version, which I think came out probably 20 years ago, was definitely a thing 10 years ago, that was the, the standard specified that it had to be uh, a COM object. And I'm not super into Windows development, so I don't even really know what all that means, but it, it was called OPC OLE, I think. And only more recently have they caught on to the idea of maybe being, you know, operating system agnostic and not specifying, you know, specific basically vendor technologies for this. But anyway, um, if, you, if you're going out there looking for um, software engineering in factories jobs, more likely than not, uh, C Sharp will be on the requirements list and generally like .NET type skills. Uh, that, that's really the common one. And, and Python, I randomly got into a Python and automation environment jobs, but that was really a weird case because the company had started without a factory or in this case a diagnostic lab and then, you know, became a wrote a lot of software in Python and then started also operating this lab. Uh, so they just stuck with Python. So, but you know, if you have situations like that, you get to use Python in industry. Otherwise you might have to do a little bit of work to, to get it in there. And then obviously on the periphery, where you know data that's already come out of these systems needs to be analyzed just like everywhere else people use whatever fits best and i think that's where python is making the most inroads data analysis on you know sensor data and things like that i think that's where you find it where you're most likely to find python yeah and i imagine too that in terms of being able to glue together some of these different proprietary systems with their own particular protocols and data formats and you know as you were mentioning some of the systems that ship with only a gui tool being able to reverse engineer some of the ways that it's trying to communicate and actually build python wrappers for that to be able to glue together the entire factory seems like it would be one of the areas that python could very effectively be leveraged within an industrial environment definitely and and actually this whole converter thing that that's a nice that's a cool little cottage industry there's like hundreds 
probably thousands of little companies out there that sell you little boxes that translate from one protocol to another and you know like serial to ethernet old opc standard to i don't know some ethernet based standard stuff like that and and python can do that job i think um the job where where Python makes even more sense is at the interface of these factory control systems and other software systems that have previously not even been connected to the factory, such as, uh, you know, inventory management systems and, and things like that. So to, to, to bridge the gap between things that are already written in, in some kind of modern software and the more traditional controls type thing, I think that's, that's really the sweet spot where, where Python as the glue makes, makes a lot of sense. And in your PyCon presentation, you commented on the fact that security in industrial automation systems is generally fairly lacking, which particularly given the fact that a lot of these facilities are, as you mentioned, you know, potentially decades old and working with hardware and software that hasn't necessarily been updated since it was first installed. So given that, what are some of the most common issues that you have seen and what are some of the other factors that play a role in introducing those different security vulnerabilities? So to be fair to all my colleagues out there in industrial automation, I didn't think, I, I think I didn't say uh, in, the, in the presentation that security is generally a problem. I think what I said is that if you're focusing on the security aspect of automation, you will have fun. <laughs> you said that you'll be busy, so I was reading a bit oh, yeah, into that's that. Right, so. Right, yeah. yeah, so the, the main problem is that, that there, there has been a, a recent trend to connect these systems that you know either were built before there was the internet as we know it, or that just were built without an intention of connecting them to the internet, and now we connect them you know, to the cloud and, and things like that. And I think that's really where the security problems arise. So actually, this is a kind of a... Um, a toy example here but one thing that happened to me this week is i was playing around with a barcode reader like one of the gun type ones that you know has like a trigger like a gun and you just plug it into your computer and it actually acts like a keyboard so you have something with a barcode on it let's i don't know your your airline boarding pass you you know click the trigger on that gun the little light comes on it it goes like beep and reads your barcode. And what actually happens is that it, like a fake keyboard, types in these characters. And, you know, systems like that are everywhere. Distribution centers, at the at the airport, obviously, your grocery store, everywhere. And they were obviously built with this one very specific application in mind, like this one type of barcode. And they always type in what, what they see. So this week, I was using one of those on a barcode that happens to be floating around in our factory and I was having the Chrome developer console open while I had to type in a barcode into a text box and suddenly I had a breakpoint set in my JavaScript and what had happened is that these barcodes they don't only include readable like printable characters they also sometimes include like lower ASCII like control characters and things and you know this specific one ended up typing F8 which apparently if you have react on your website triggers a breakpoint in react somehow um <laughs> you know and this is this is like this i think is a great example of how you suddenly get an attack surface on systems like this right now you can start thinking oh well if i can put like an f8 key into a, a barcode can i put the windows key in it and if i can put the windows key can i start any program on the user's computer without them having really any chance to stop it you know how far can i take this and that's just the barcode now you have systems, you know, a barcode has like maybe a hundred characters in it if you have a, a big one, like a 2D barcode. Now you have systems in your factory that, that were built with the same kind of mindset of just making something work that communicate, you know, that maybe used to communicate over a serial protocol and they send each other thousands of characters every minute. Uh, and someone had the genius idea of maybe we should run that that content over Ethernet and didn't realize that that Ethernet, you know, is also connected to the office network. And before you know it, you have like these these crazy hacks that hit the news, like Stuxnet, when, you know, some government entity attacked the Iranian uh, uh, uranium enrichment uh, facilities like this was, I think, three or four years ago. And, you know, they, they found a way to deploy some some of the software inside that facility. And once they were in, they, you know, I mean, I don't know the details, but I assume they were listening on a network 
on what's going on there and then just started talking too. And because these systems weren't designed to authenticate who's speaking or use encryption, that might have been quite easy. And um, I was actually just reading this week uh, this report it's by a security company called ESET about a, a malware called Indestroyer, which I think is an awesome word. <laughs> and apparently uh, this Indestroyer might be responsible for, for a big power outage in Ukraine just half a year ago. And there was this description of how it works and it, it barely qualifies as a hack. It's basically software that happens to implement these, these standards you know, I, I just wrote this, where is it? I wrote this down somewhere just before before the, the, we started recording here. Like IEC 61850 apparently is a standard for how electrical substations in the electrical grid communicate. And, you know, in destroyer basically just implements that standard and knows what commands to send to switch off a couple of switches or something like that. And that's, that's the security aspect of industrial automation. And there are, you know, very promising trends if you go to uh, to trade shows, there are companies there that you know sell you products or libraries that do very clever, you know, that that just do best practices, encrypt your communication, check authenticity, stuff like that. But there's a lot of old technology out there, and there's I think uh, we just haven't seen enough hacks that there's a strong security mindset among the people who built these systems and use them. So I, I think we'll we'll have another couple of years or maybe a couple of decades of pretty exciting stories about hacks in that space coming up, or you know, for better or worse. Yeah, and also given that a lot of these systems that do have these vulnerabilities in them, there's a lot more of a capital expenditure needed to be able to actually upgrade or replace them versus, you know, adding an encryption library to your software that's running your web server. That's true. I mean, it, it depends, right? Some things it's as easy as not using a default password or maybe, you know, not plugging it into the into the company-wide network after all, because, uh, or maybe having just like having someone install a firewall, you know, there's like some simple practices that I'm sure, you know, some listeners are laughing at me now. It's like, well, of course, everyone's doing that. I have a factory and I have a firewall. Like, what else would you be doing? Well, I've seen a factory, you know, that doesn't do that just because it's, you know, a small operation and they, they don't know. So... I think it's the same as everywhere, right? We had like all these credit card hacks and now we slowly get like, even in the US we get chip and pin and you know, in Europe they do like, I don't know if they still do verified by visa, by visa or get like transaction numbers. You know, once it goes wrong a couple of times, people, you know, it catches on and people start acting on it. And I, I think um, we're, we're just at this point where the field of industrial automation learns that lesson. And so for doing development that's targeted at a... Uh, factory or a you know industrial facility how does the overall life cycle of that software differ from when you are doing uh, you know a web app development where you have the sort of QA environment and then the production environment and what are the life cycles like on production rollouts where a lot of companies that are doing purely software-based systems are moving more towards continuous delivery where they'll have multiple deploys a day. Is that something that you see at all in these manufacturing facilities or is it more the typical waterfall approach where you have a you know, large set of changes that you will batch up and then deploy all at once to a system at you know set intervals? I, I think there's a broad spectrum depending on the application and there's also a bit of a change happening you know, currently just as the technology gets more modern. One thing is if, if you have... A steel factory that's making steel or you know something that's just not super like where the process isn't changing that's not very IT intensive the model there really is you write it once it goes into the factory and then it runs until the factory gets decommissioned <laughs> so that's the life cycle there unlike more uh, there are many applications however where that you know get hooked up let's say to the cloud now and where where Maybe sensor data gets gets streamed at you know very high measurement frequencies, uh, so that there are machine learning systems that try to predict uh, when maintenance is required or predict failures. Like that's a very common thing. It's condition monitoring that that's really taking off now. And when you hear industrial Internet of Things, in many cases, what they actually are talking about is this base use case of let's get all the data we can get out of our factory and analyze it. If that's the area you're in, I would assume that if you're, you know, if you're writing the software that's closer to the sensors, then you're maybe on like a monthly release cycle. And the further away you get from the machinery, I think it's you get more to the continuous delivery type mindset. And so uh, it really depends on the industry you're in um, and 
what it, like where exactly the software you're writing is in the stack. One of the things too that I think would be fairly challenging is the idea of having a QA environment that's a close replica of production because of the amount of capital expenditure that's necessary to build the factory in the first place. You're not going to build a second one just to test all of your software. So that's where I think we go back to our earlier conversation about testing and being able to roll out these changes in a in a staged way where you have all of your unit tests to make sure the software functions and then doing the factory acceptance testing. So I imagine that would also affect the the overall release cycles that you can work with when you're actually directly interfacing with the machinery. Definitely. And one thing I should also say to qualify many of the things I'm saying is that this role that I'm in, where I'm a software engineer that's working at the company that's operating the factory, that's extremely rare. In most cases, at least the software that's close to the control system and you know running the machines, that's written by the machine vendor. And they obviously have different a different um ability to test things because if you are you know if you are like a robot arm vendor say uh, you sell you know thousands of these robots arms every year obviously you have like a bank of tens or 50 of them for for your testing similarly uh, and then and then if you get to system integrators or people who actually write software for for a factory they own like which is which is the the role that I'm in then you have the inverse you have much more control and you have the freedom to deploy more software but you have much less ability to test with the safety net i i've been in an environment where we got pretty close to having a replica of the factory but i'm i'm i've also been in an environment where every time you deploy software you cause downtime and then you have to do testing with the end users like all the you know you did all the factory acceptance tests and, and site acceptance tests and user acceptance tests were all the same thing uh, you tried to do that in you know maybe a two hour overnight time slot and the next morning uh, the factory had to be working again that's also a possible environment and I I prefer the latter because even though it's more stress, it obviously gives you a lot more freedom to do to innovate and to also to iterate and 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 actually make a tease out that the last bit of performance or of your factory or build cool new features that others can't replicate because they would have to call up some machine vendor or systems integrator to build it. So there's a trade-off there. And aside from manufacturing facilities, what are some of the other types of industrial environments that might require the same kinds of systems integration or hardware automation that you're aware of? Uh, yeah, there are a lot. So when, when I say industrial automation, I sort of implicitly always include laboratory automation because that's that's the setting that, that I've spent many years in. And while there are some differences, uh, in the end, you deal with robots and machines that have some sort of API or way to control them and, and you can layer software on top to make them do what you need to do. Their uh, logistics is, is a huge area that's also very, you know, distribution centers and... Um, things like that everyone loves ordering from amazon now and these warehouses are you know in effect gigantic robots that just ferry things around you know things like airports the luggage handling system again it's just automation all the way like it's, it's basically a factory all the infrastructure around us i just mentioned the power grid in the context of the security question those are the things that come to mind readily but you just look around you and the, the built environment and, and all the things that you're using every day and you think about where they come from it's probably a place that that's using industrial automation technology yeah and also as things like self-driving cars or smart cities become more prevalent i imagine that'll also introduce new arenas where this kind of skill set would be able to be applied definitely and and cars are actually quite similar i i uh, I, I, one of the talks I went to at, at PyCon was, was actually about hacking cars. And just like a factory, cars tend to have many processors distributed throughout an, an onboard network. And of course, there are motors and actuators everywhere in the car. To, you know, there's the engine, but there's also the, th the motors that uh, do, uh, do your, you know, the, the windows, get the windows up and down and all, all these things. So in a way, cars are very much equivalent to factories, but obviously then there, there are differences, like the communication protocols are different and you know you use different products, but I think very similar principles apply. And what are some of the most interesting or challenging projects that you've worked on? Oh, that's a broad question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I have an answer ready for that, but there, there are, I mean, challenging in, in this 
in this type of work, probably like most other places, there, there are two types of it. There's the project that's challenging because it's incredibly deep and you just have to, you have to be one of, they call it, don't they call it like a T-shaped person who has like an enormous amount of expertise in one area and, and, and can cover that. And well, that's not really me. So I probably don't have an example for that. And then there's, there are the projects that are, that are challenging because just of the sheer complexity of all the moving pieces. And in this case, moving is like literal, right? Moving pieces in a factory. And those those are abundant in, in automation. I think the most challenging one was definitely the, this diagnostic lab that I worked at. Now that I've mentioned it like 10 times in, in this talk, I should probably mention what company it was. So I, I worked at this company called Council, who offers genetic tests. And when you say genetic test, the people who are somewhat knowledgeable are aware that there's a sequencing machine at the end that performs the sequencing and turns your DNA into a series of characters that can then be analyzed. It's like the helicopter height, high level view of what's going on. Uh, what most people don't know is that there's like a sequence of, you know, a hundred steps before that, where your blood or your saliva that, you know, your, your doctor probably collected from you gets broken down so that there, there is even any DNA to be analyzed. It gets broken down and kind of sorted and filtered and, and all these things. And each one of those, you know, when I say filtered, this might involve 10 high-level process steps, each of which can be broken down in another 50 little ones. So we built this, we built this facility where the ultimate goal was that really like your sample tube of blood or saliva gets inserted, like gets inserted into a machine, somebody clicks, like hits go, and then it just goes through all these steps. And and doing that with you know hundreds of thousands of samples every day and we in terms of the software we end up so i was leading the software part of the automation team at that company um, and we ended up with literally like hundreds of individual uh, virtual machines running our servers each one being in charge of either talking to an instrument or doing some kind of uh, work cell level scheduling where you have a, like a handful of machines that work together all the way up to scheduling basically what's going on in the building making sure that everyone samples in the right place at the right time and and that was one of those projects where that was just extremely challenging because of the sheer complexity of all the things that are that are happening there and for every instrument you have to you know go from the detail level of how are the bytes aligned in the communication protocol all the way to when does it need to be switched on so that I don't heat the the sample for too long things like that and that was challenging and that's also like for me that's the kind of project I just love working on which which is why I love working on factories so so those, th that was very cool for my day-to-day, -day, I work on doing cloud automation, which, again, it's interesting because you're tying together all these various bits and pieces to be able to get one continuous flow that ends with the result that you're looking for. But I imagine that having the extra layer of complexity of actually having all of these physical moving parts and all of the different domain knowledge that's necessary to be able to properly drive the different mechanisms from a electronics perspective, as well as from, you know, particularly in the case that you were saying about doing the genetic testing of understanding the material limitations of the substance that you're processing to make sure that it's within its tolerances during this entire sequence of events. Sure. And it's one of those things that you just can't work on this as an individual. You know, there are some, some problems in the world a person can solve, and then there are others that are just too big. So uh, you need a team for it. And, and that, you know, I think both your, your line of work and mine definitely fall into that latter category where you, you have a team. So I never had to understand genetics to, to help automate the genetics lab. And you stand on the shoulders of giants, right? There are other people who, who are that other type of person I talk about who are like, you know, the T-shape who, who uh, go really deep on one thing. Um, and there's just fascinating work going on at the super detailed level. I talked with, uh, with a gentleman who works at a company called Cognex who do vision type systems and, and barcode readers. And he has been working on this project where when barcodes get read, you want to be as fast as possible because that means that if you're in a distribution center, you can move things past the scanner much faster. So he was telling me how the software innovation in that field is getting to the point where you need less than one pixel per bar in the barcode to still be able to read the barcode. So, you know, just think about like the cool algorithms work that goes into that. Or people who work like, uh, actually same person who told me about this, like people who do barcode reading again, but oftentimes barcodes get damaged. And if you operate a factory and you have like a level of 10% of damaged barcodes, you want to know why. So someone out there has gone out and written an algorithm that figures out what's wrong with the barcode. Has it been torn or folded over or is something stuck on top of it? So you, you know, 
there's like like anywhere else like you know this is in cloud computing same as in, in industrial automation there there's just an amazing number of little projects done by by really clever people and only because you put it all together uh, does anything in this world work and so in your day-to-day what are some of the most useful python packages that you leverage Oh yeah, so I knew that this question was coming. So I was um, like racking my brain on what a good answer would be. And surprisingly, I couldn't really come up with any that are specific to industrial automation. The one I could say that I've been using a lot is PySerial, which is the you know a very old, very powerful Python package that you can use to talk to the serial port. But then again, that's you know that's just one example. So the other the other packages that I, I ended up putting on my list by going through you know requirements files. That that I've been touching recently are actually just ones that are related to to testing. I think those are like I, I have a list here with like things like Factory Boy for Django to to do um, basically deal with uh, kind of fixtures in a better way. The parameterized package to to write tests in a more efficient manner. Freeze Gun. Uh, time often, like I mentioned, time earlier is like one of the things that you have to be more aware of when you do work with physical systems than when not. There's a package called Freeze Gun that you can use to basically freeze time in your tests. That's one that I've I've, I've used quite often. So these are these are the things that that end up being on my list for the actual for actually talking to instruments quite often the standard library is good enough. You know, if you're just like putting like putting a bunch of bytes together to send out just the right byte string that an instrument needs, well, then you've got struct. If you need a little server, like like what I demoed in my PyCon talk, just like a, an HTTP server that you can use to receive commands from over the network and turn it into something to make an instrument do something, well, then there's XML RPC that's, that's there in the standard library. Uh, so yeah, long story short, I didn't really have come up with a good list of packages here. <laughs> Well, it's actually kind of a good sign when you're able to do most of the work that you need to do just with what already ships with the language and not necessarily having to reach out into sort of exotic libraries and packages that are necessarily domain specific. Yeah, and th- that was actually one of the points of my, my PyCon talk. I mean, I used PySerial, okay, um, but beyond that, most of the things I showed were either pure standard library Python or like pretty small packages that do a bit, little bit of convenience and you know, add a little layer of abstraction to to make the commands shorter. But one of the points was to say, hey, look, this is easy and you can do it. In fact, someone told me after the talk that this was this was a talk that really gave them the sense that they could sit down like right now or right after they get home from PyCon and just start doing this because it's very approachable and accessible. There's no crazy science to master to get started, you know, making a little robot move from one end of the table to the other. It's, it's actually very easy. That's kind of, was kind of the point of my talk, actually. And for somebody who does want to get involved in industrial automation or working with manufacturing facilities, what are some of the kinds of experience or background that they should have? And what are some of the resources that you recommend people take a look at if they do want to get involved in that line of work? Now, that, that is a very tricky question, actually, because it's definitely not the field where, where there's an abundance of blog posts out there, like how to get started controlling conveyor belts is, I bet you there's like zero results if you like, look for that. So it, um, depending on where, like, where you come from, there might be different approaches. So if you're already in, in an area like machine learning, I think the right approach would be to just start moving, gradually moving to applications where the data source is industrial systems and with this whole industrial internet of things trend going on that should be something that's relatively easy to find both in terms of like if you're looking for a job that's a you know industrial internet of things could be your keyword or if you're looking for tutorials or white papers and things like that that would work if you're really trying to get into that that type of software that i was talking about a little bit here uh where you control individual instruments the prerequisite really is to know a little bit about how a factory works and even though everything that we have is made in factories, uh, people know surprisingly little about like what even what the pieces are that that make up a factory. So you would really start there. And some things I could recommend is uh, try to get on factory tours. I think that's that's the biggest one. Um, in some in some cities, uh, there are factory tour meetups where you know groups of people just go out and somehow get themselves invited for tours of factories. Sometimes when you're 
a customer of a product or you know someone who works in a factory, you can you can get a, a tour relatively easily. I know that Tesla, the Tesla factory in Fremont here in the Bay Area, they offer that to employees and their friends. I think they have a regular tour schedule going on. And I have so far not been able to get in one of there. If anyone here is listening, wants to invite me, just uh, my contact details on the show notes. Anyway, <laughs> um, then uh, if that doesn't work, there's just YouTube and I guess television. Also, if there's still television watching people out there, there's like these shows like how it's made or like just a lot of just search for factory tour on YouTube or, you know, if you're into cars, maybe I know that uh, BMW has a, has a set of really cool factory tours out there. Also, just machine vendors trying to sell their machines. Any machine you can think of, just type into YouTube like machine name factory or machine name demonstration and, and you usually get these sometimes quite absurd and sometimes very educational videos of just watching machines do something. Thing. watching machines make paper clips watching machines make screws watching machines make i don't know you know like packaging salami like just whatever like pick a thing that is in like your field of peripheral vision right now type in object name how it's made so you, you to get an idea of how like what are the machines that you would encounter and then if you're getting a little more serious about it uh, once you have a handle of just like rough ideas of the nature of machines um, you can you could guys start going to trade shows. Generally, vendors and manufacturers are the biggest source of educational material in this area. There aren't really any books about many many of those topics. Like I know that there's one one big book about barcodes, for example. But really, the way to learn about how to have barcode and ID systems is you go to the vendors who build these things and just get all the white papers and documentation and maybe on-site demo if you work for someone who could pass off as a potential customer and just have them teach you all about it. That's really the way I would go. A couple of more scrappy ways. You can go on eBay. There's an this entire industry of people who sell secondhand factory equipment. Just go to the right section there. Just start exploring. If you see a thing that you don't know what it does, you know, Google it uh, and and find the manual and just start reading. And that that that's those are the things I could come up with when I was preparing, you know, for because someone asked this question on Twitter, I think, and, and I saw that earlier today. And I was trying to think, oh, what am I gonna tell them? Also, I, oh one more thing, uh, catalogs. Just go go to the catalogs of manufacturers or there's or companies that sell them macmaster.com is a website that sells anything from screws to programmable logic controllers just take a look like even finding out what the options are uh, is really interesting. Like for my PyCon talk, this was the first time I was buying a conveyor belt. Finding out like what are the things I can specify when I purchase a conveyor belt, that was extremely educational actually. So yeah, but, but um, really the big takeaway is uh, you have to lean on the people who build this equipment or sell it for information because there aren't any conveyor belts for dummies books out there by O'Reilly, as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward, what are some of the innovations in industrial automation that you're most excited about? Well, I'm excited about everything, every, every application where the factory gets connected to complicated software systems. So every time someone deploys some machine learning uh, algorithm to a factory or some advanced scheduling algorithm, those are the things where, where you know, the, the interface of modern software development, the things that we know of from you know, the Googles and the Facebooks and I don't know, the, the Yelps and Instagrams out there, like the tech they're building where that sort of, that that software, that, that level of software get, uh, caliber gets combined with, with industry. Um, so I mentioned this earlier, there's a big trend to connect sensors to advanced algorithms and just in general, like the, the cloud to have the data there and then do useful things with it. The next step, of course, is to go the other way and send like control what's happening in your factory based on information that lives outside and if you take that to the extreme so the simple version of that is you have a car production line and the cars that are coming off all come in different colors and with different interior options right so that's obviously software on the outside that's running like the, the orders database and the inventory database controlling what each robot is doing as, as it assembles the car making sure that the right type of seat is right next to the production line when the car that needs that seat gets assembled so that's it's like the base level and that's been going on for many years. What's happening now is that this mass customization starts becoming feasible where every item 
that's going through a factory is completely different. So you see that like 3D printing is a great example. There are people who um, make customized uh, insoles or even entire shoes. Once you have a factory where every shoe that's coming off has a name tag on it because it only fits that person, that's really cool. And we're actually getting there. Uh, likewise, you know, other applications are prototypes. So com the company I work for, uh, we make these circuit boards and the problem of making thousands of circuit boards very quickly in a highly automated fashion, that's been solved for a while. The problem of making five circuit boards of a type in a very automated fashion. That's something that we're only getting to now because that requires hooking up the software that you know ingests the order and actually figures out how the machine needs to be set up, hooking that up to the machine. So I think that, that weird thing where the interface of software systems and programming already automated machines to be even more automated, that's something that, that I think is really taking off now. And, and then actually one thing I should definitely mention is just life sciences in general. If you've been, if you know anything about biotech or gen genetics in particular, maybe you've heard about CRISPR, like that field is just taking off. I think um, people are like synthesizing genomes. You design a genome on your computer and, and you you send it to a factory that just synthesizes that DNA that actually puts like takes in a string you send it and put the DNA together send it back to you uh, using that for a variety of applications I think that's just fascinating and there was also a PyCon talk about this um, let me see uh, I think Riley Doyle was the speaker and he was talking about reprogramming the human genome he mentioned a couple of those examples where, where Python is actually used to power applications like that there, there used to be a, a company called Transcriptic where that literally had a web API that let you control their lab robots to do biology experiments for them. I think they are not doing this in a fashion that's open to the public anymore, but I think that sort of thing is taking off. I know that Autodesk, the company that's doing uh, computer-aided design software, uh, is starting to get into life science software. So you, much like an architect would plan a skyscraper using Autodesk CAD software, there's now software to construct genomes. And then, you know, again, send it up to an automated factory. These are factories that could never be not automated because no human can actually perform that work. Uh, and and then they, they have this ultra customized everything that's coming off the line is different type setup. That, that's something that I find really exciting. And I think we'll see a lot of those applications where everything is different when it comes up, like every, every item coming off the production line is different from the one before. We'll see a lot of those, hopefully over the next five to 10 years. Maybe it takes a little longer. All right. Yeah, it's definitely a very interesting and wide open area. It'll be interesting to see how these things evolve as technology increases and the capabilities of these facilities increase accordingly. And so are there any other topics or questions that you think we should cover before we start to close out the show? I think the one thing I should say is, uh, so we are hiring at Tempo Automation. I, I already mentioned what we do. So if you're at all interested in electronics, circuit boards, have any background in that area, or just really like using Python for, for cool applications, uh, you should uh, check out our website or just contact me. And so we're looking for, yeah, for people familiar with the Python stack and really interested in working with factories. All right. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch and follow the work that you're up to, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And with that, I will move us to the picks. And so this week, I'm going to choose the band Opeth, which is a progressive metal band out of, I can't remember exactly which country, but I believe they're from Scandinavia somewhere. And uh, yeah, just a really interesting band, a lot of different musical styles across their different albums. I've enjoyed the, enjoyed them for a while. And uh, if you're int into sort of progressive rock or progressive metal, I definitely recommend giving them a listen. And so with that, I will pass it to you. Do you have any picks for us today, Jonas? I do. And I thought that because... PyCon is still not too long in the past. I, I would just have a small selection of, of PyCon talks that I enjoyed. And I also didn't really get to attend that many talks. So most of these I watched on YouTube after the conference. So there were some that were in, in the same vein as you know my talk about factory automation where someone's using Python for something else. I found a really great talk uh, was by, by Eric Evanchik, I think is his name, uh, Hacking Cars with Python. So we already kind of alluded to that during the talk during talking here that you can use python to to do to work with cars much like you can use it for factories there's a, another talk about um, a bike speedometer with micropython by by tim head i think is his name and that was that's something i just have to do more reading about uh, but micropython which is 
using Python to program microcontrollers is a really cool thing because programming microcontrollers like embedded development is hard and if you can use a language like python that's pretty you know approachable for it that's great so that talk was was good fun catherine scott talked about python from space i should mention here that i'm kind of like an en passant colleague of hers we work at the same company but not at the same time but she was talking about uh working with data from from the satellite so her company has uh is, is called planet and they have hundreds of satellites up in orbit and they get pictures of pretty much everywhere in the world. I think they're aiming for daily pictures of every spot on Earth. And she was showing off like in this nonstop live demo style talk what you can do with that. That was really great. And let's see what, what else. There were a couple of talks about Unicode. I just would encourage everyone to, to look into Unicode. There was a talk about, there's a talk by, by this fellow, uh, Lukas Lange, who has a un, like a non-ASCII character in his name. He gives ex very funny talks about Unicode because you know he's kind of like affected. Um, another talk was about comparing and sorting Unicode, which is surprisingly non-obvious and kind of mind-bending. And then I, I probably won't go into details on those, but there was a series of talks about Python and science. And I just, I was really fascinated by that. I think um, both of the keynotes by Jake Vanderplas and, and uh, I think her name was Katie Huff, who are, who are scientists um, and, and just talk about how, how software skills are super applicable to science and kind of encourage the community to maybe help out with these open source science projects because you don't need to be a scientist to write software for science. I thought that was uh, a great. And then I, I, I guess I'm not. I, I'm, I'm always super behind on my podcast, so I completely forgot that we can have non-technical, like non-Python things as picks. So I, um, I definitely want to mention a newsletter. There's a newsletter called The Prepared by uh, Spencer Wright, and every week he sends out links related to manufacturing, logistics, sometimes transport and cities which as you found out by now i'm super interested in and if you're interested in that you should totally subscribe to that newsletter because i i usually click every single link in there so i i, str I really strongly recommend that newsletter and finally something completely like out there non-technical i recently did an amtrak ride from chicago to the bay area um and and you know i'm not from this country so i always laugh about like the rail infrastructure the passenger rail infrastructure in the u.s but that was just mind-blowing seeing all these all these landscapes and just seeing seeing parts of the country you would never see so uh next year um PyCon is in um uh, now i forgot do you remember what the city is called at uh, cleveland they have an amtrak station so maybe when you plan your trip, consider taking the train there because I think if you haven't done this before, especially the the the, the trains that go you know across the continental divide, that's something I think everyone should have seen this. So do it. Well, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to share your interest and passion for factory automation and industrial automation. It's definitely a really interesting area and one that most people don't necessarily get to get a you know inside view of. So I appreciate you taking the time to put the talk together at PyCon and uh, take the time tonight to you know dig deeper into that. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, thanks. And, and thank you for having me. Yeah.